Hi, my name is Fins. I'm a tech evangelist and Oracle Ace Director. Uh, I'm going to be talking about FluentD today and its wor uh, work with logs on how we, we can use it to make our lives a lot easier uh, in operations and development environments. So let's uh, introduce myself properly first. Um, uh, in five uh, quick bullets, I'm a, a father, uh, I'm a, a husband, uh, a blogger and an author. Um, I also happen to help run a, a developer meetup here in London and uh, currently working on a book called Unified Logging with FluentD uh, and it's in the early access program at the moment so about halfway through uh, and you can read a lot about uh, the use and configuration of FluentD uh, and why we might want to use FluentD in different scenarios. Uh, I work, as I say, I work for Capgemini and I'm fortunate enough to work with a very successful uh, UK team uh, and we've won a number of awards over the last couple of years. Uh, so that's us. Um, but before um, I get into, into the nuts and bolts of it, it's worth looking at uh, um, looking at monitoring uh, and putting it into context. Uh, so the idea of monitoring is actually if you use the, the go back to the old English language definitions is to observe and see what's happening over a period of time uh, and, and see what's happening and uh, that's led to some ideas such as observability uh, and the three pillars of observability uh, which is quite a useful vehicle. Um, it's important because um, we all work from different perspectives and uh, depending on your viewpoint and your role in an organization you may well uh, think logging or monitoring is um, very different if you're a, a, an infrastructure expert to when you're in apps or uh, if you're working from a low code perspective or uh, into uh, business solutions and uh, BPM and things like that. So let's have a quick look at uh, the stack and the three layers of observability. So one way of observing things is to look at it from a numerical perspective. This is capturing your CPU usage. This is capturing your memory uh, resources and very numeric statistical perspective. The next way we can uh, look at um, the, the monitoring capabilities uh, is around the idea of logs. And this is where FluentD is really at its strength, but we'll come back to that in a, in a little while. Um, but, you know, logs are equally important as those statistical facts. Uh, when you have a problem with your server, it's likely to put in information into an SNMP trap or using another mechanism uh, to report the nature of the issues that you're experiencing. Uh, you know, hardware fault and things like that. And of course in applications, most of us uh, that work as developers actually use logs as uh, bread and butter and we use it for a number of different reasons from helping us understand and making sure the software develop we're developing is running and behaving as expected through to uh, creating audit trail events uh, and information that uh, meets security requirements. Uh, uh, and uh, tracking user activities uh, to help address SIM requirements. And then you've got the, the latest sort of evolution, which is around the uh, application of tracing, uh, where you're wanting to see how events start on one node in a distributed environment and they will track through different applications and, and components such as various microservices that you might be running in Kubernetes through a Kafka uh, a stream perhaps uh, through your API gateways in and out uh, and seeing where the delays are where the performance issues are and details like that and that's tracing for you and then the best way to uh, examine that is, as I mentioned, some of the examples. But um, let's look, you know, hosting and the infrastructure level monitoring activities tend to be uh, heavily focused on the metrics side of things with a little bit of uh, the, the log characteristics and 
practically no real tracing on the infrastructure layer. And then when we get to virtualization, uh, the VMs or your container frameworks such as Kubernetes, um, it's again still fairly strong on the numerical side of things, but logs become a, a lot more prevalent and we start to see a little bit of tracing coming in. And we move up the stack a bit further and then move into the application space. Uh, your tracing is, is probably just as important now as your logs. And actually the stats drop off a little bit and they change in nature because you're more likely to be interested in uh, the stats from your virtual machine uh, and making sure that your application is tuned correctly rather than perhaps raw pure CPU issues. We can then look at uh, above that in, into the, the business uh, uh, application monitoring. So that's looking at how many transactions you've completed from a, a business perspective. So that's you know, from uh, purchase to, to completion to fulfillment uh, and processes like that. And of course then on top of that, we have security uh, considerations and security is looking at uh, a lot of log things that you know what's a user done when when did they sign in when did they sign out how often are they interacting uh, how often do they fail uh, to get the credentials right and things like that and then on the other side of the spectrum you're trying to capture the capacity insights uh, so that uh, you can scale and forecast demand do uh, uh, charging potentially if you're sharing the costs of uh, running a back end amongst different uh, teams and things like that. So let's have a look at application logs more specifically. Uh, why do we use them? Well, we're looking for uh, unexpected errors as mentioned. Um, when when something doesn't behave as we expect it, one of the things that will tell us what's going on or why it's happened is obviously our application log. Um, we want to look at things like uh, uh, um, performance issues. Uh, classic uh, uh, measures for that are things like uh, looking at your database or uh, uh, your storage mechanism and looking at things like slow query logs and uh, looking at the query performance and pulling that out um, and then of course as I mentioned that we've got uh, GDPR compliance and uh, all sorts of other legislative requirements these days that mean that we have to create audit trails and record what users are doing uh, so that uh, in the event of an investigation or something suspect happening uh, or you're questioning a user's actions for some reason uh, then you can actually go back through and understand what they've done, when they did it, uh, even potentially why they did it. But the bottom line is, is in all of this, it's always about feeding the business need uh, so that uh, uh, we can understand the value that we're bringing to the business and succeeding in resolving uh, business problems or, or confirming that business is running uh, smoothly and everything's behaving as expected and we're not losing data and things like that so if anybody raises a question you got the evidence to support it uh, but it's all about the impact if, if there's no clear business connection to, to what we're monitoring then uh, sooner or later we're going to get the, the activities of developing monitoring um, shut down so you know that could be simply monitoring to optimize performance uh, and make sure that we're uh, running our environment efficiently or uh, at the other end of the spectrum monitoring to make sure that nobody's abusing the system um, one of the things that we've seen over the years is changing complexity uh, and that's impacted our ability to monitor whether it's through logs or through metrics but it's worth just understanding how significant the complexity has evolved. So when we uh, um, s started the IT industry, if you like, back in the 50s and 60s, we didn't have to deal with concurrency. We didn't have issues of distribution. Um, uh, scaling was, well, wh whatever the computer could do. If you could buy a bigger computer, then maybe you could scale and do a bit more. But that was the limitations. 
And then as the time's moved on, uh, we've got into multi-threaded in a single CPU uh, or within a single server or multiple CPUs on a single server, as you'd see in a, in a uh, um, large enterprise uh, infrastructure uh, and mainframe computing. Uh, and with that, we've seen uh, things like the Tomcat uh, and uh, servlet-based applications, uh, some SOA platforms such as uh, the Oracle Service Bus, amongst others, coming in. But it's largely uh, focused on a single CPU with threads. And then over time, we've actually scaled that out uh, and started to distribute the workload. But typically, when you distribute the workload, an end to end process still remains on one server. Uh, you don't start jumping around the servers too much uh, unless you're calling a, a discrete uh, component like a database, uh, in which case that might be hosted on a different uh, piece of infrastructure, but you're still fairly easy to track what's going on. It's still happening within one environment normally. Um, then as we've uh, evolved the game, we've uh, driven up the level of asynchronous behavior and uh, we've got to uh, look at Node.js as a great example of that, where we've moved away from a threading model um, to more of a, uh, a single threaded, but we're picking up and putting down workloads based on the IO requirements and things like that, uh, and asynchronous behavior. Um, Kafka is another example of that kind of thing. And then, of course, we're into all our distributed uh, uh, mechanisms as well, where we've uh, developed scale out um, and we can spin up, particularly in the advent of, uh, of uh, cloud then, uh, and greater elasticity in our operations. We can spin up new servers uh, at the drop of the hat to scale out part of our application space. Uh, and as a result, uh, combine that with asynchronous and jobs can suddenly bounce around different servers as they process through their life within our application. So the complexity has just escalated phenomenally and we've got to respond to that with our ability to measure and monitor. Um, and, and then there are a number of techniques that we've put, uh, have been brought to bear, you know, 20 years ago, we might have just looked at one log file. Now we have many, uh, many sources of logs as well, and it's distributed. So Fluent D is uh, a, a tool that can help us address that. So let's introduce Fluent D. Um, it's not the most well known of products out there, but uh, it is certainly amongst those that are interested and involved in, in DevOps and uh, operational activities, um, something that people are, are becoming increasingly aware of. Its legacy actually was uh, in big data with a company called Treasure Data who open sourced it. And then um, over time, it's become uh, an open source project and under the governance of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation or CNCF. Uh, and that's really when it started to uh, get a lot of traction. Uh, in many respects because it's got the open governance. Uh, it's become part of the, the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem um, and it's vendor neutral. Uh, but it's highly pluggable. There are other technologies in this space that uh, people know. We, we, we've uh, heard of the ELK stack, which we'll come up into in a moment. Uh, but Fluent D is basically a, 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 a very lightweight framework that actually used, uses uh, a lot of plugins. So you can build your own plugins. A lot of vendors have uh, made their solutions compatible with uh, Fluent D uh, by building plugins. So you can incorporate or feed your Fluent D uh, monitored environments uh, to their tools. So um, we can see from uh, many directions capturing the data and feeding it to Splunk as an industry leading product in the, the log aggregation analytics, particularly for security use cases. 
uh, through to integrating with the cloud native solutions that uh, Amazon and Google provide uh, and Oracle now as well with uh, their latest offering in, in this space. Um, and of course, if you're building a, a bespoke uh, solution, uh, you might uh, want to build your own custom plugin, uh, either to uh, inject uh, log uh, data into FluentD or to actually pull it out if you're trying to do some analysis. But this highly pluggable nature has made it very, very powerful, very, very flexible. And there's something in the order of 500 plus plugins. Not all of them are out of the box FluentD. Uh, there is a, a very lively and vibrant uh, open source community contributing uh, quite a few of these in addition to the core uh, governed uh, uh, part of uh, FernD. So it means that uh, the plugins allow us to uh, do things like formatting, filtering, uh, deal with different storage technologies from Elasticsearch through to S3 buckets. Uh, and many other things. Um, it allows us to uh, build caching and using caching uh, products as well as parsing the payload so we can start to extract meaning out of the log events that we uh, capture and uh, start to then apply rules about you know do we need to pass it on, who needs it because some organizations as we'll uh, see shortly um, We'll say actually the security team want to use Splunk, but uh, perhaps the ops team want to use Nagios, uh, and s there will be an overlap of information, so we need to route it to the right place. Um, we can actually look at the life cycle of uh, logs um, and therefore uh, what uh, we expect and what we need from a, an overall monitoring solution. Uh, and uh, a log management uh, and log unification mechanism um, as a, a life cycle. So uh, we see at uh, one end of the spectrum, the uh, log events have been generated by vast numbers of different components from, uh, from Kubernetes even, uh, from the server infrastructure, from your applications, from the business process layers. And uh, uh, they all need to be captured and processed or uh, uh, determined to, on their relevance and, and need um, in terms of uh, what to do with them. So we need to take them in uh, and ingest them uh, dynamically and then uh, evaluate what they are and uh, route them, potentially manipulating the structure of the, the log events so that they can be consumed by the target product. Uh, some systems just want the whole blob as text, others want a structured JSON file, uh, a payload, uh, so they can process it in a particular way. Um, and the, in that process, as you uh, uh, feed that into a, a system, you might want to um, either dynamically grab it and push an event out because it's a critical error that's been spotted within the stream of log events that you're you're capturing or actually you want to aggregate and look for patterns in, in activity um, and this is how a lot of the SIEM tools work uh, where they're looking at uh, user behavior over time to see if there's anom any anomalies in, in the ways people are using systems um, and then of course we might want to visualize the data, you know, what's the demand profile look like visually, what's our consumption, uh, when do we see uh, uh, problems occurring and performance and, and correlate that and visually show how that might relate to how other components in and our infrastructure are working. You know, does our application suddenly throw an error uh, when the database server shows it's under some load? Uh, well, if you've got that visually represented, it's easy to spot those correlations or you could incorporate AI and, and, and some clever tricks to actually find those patterns for you. And of course, there's no point in doing all that analysis if, if you're not going to then act upon it. So we need to be able to notify people, alert people to these things, particularly uh, um, time sensitive uh, notifications. Uh, when it's uh, operationally critical, you know, a server's collapsed, uh, 
your database is suddenly starting to grind because it's uh, running out of storage for some unexpected reason um, along with perhaps even generating uh, Jira tickets to say look you know uh, this is a bug or this is an error that has cropped up uh, so many times today uh, it needs to be investigated because it's uh, you know too frequent so I mentioned the ALK stack or elastic uh, uh, log stash and uh, Kibana um, it's probably the best known stack for monitoring um, we have a log stash at the bottom of the stack and it has a, a, a baby uh, brother if you like called beats which uh, is uh, designed to be ultra light footprint so that you can deploy in IoT style solutions and, and highly distributed uh, solutions um, and it has a limited capability compared to the full log stash then of course you've got the aggregated layer where uh, you're taking all of your log events uh, and putting them to elastic search you so you can start doing analysis trend uh, occurrences what's happened over time look at your overall history uh, so it means that local servers do not have to retain logs for very long uh, it gives you a central repository that uh, people can then interrogate what's going on and of course as I say we need to visualize all of that and there's uh, a Kibana all of these come from uh, Elastic as, as a vendor uh, and um, there's a lot of commonality with FluentD in, in this uh, so let me bring in the EFK stack EFK is, is coming in because FluentD is starting to be seen as an alternative uh, and potentially displacing uh, the uh, log stash um, and that's been driven from a couple of dimensions first of all as I say FluentD has got a lot more richness in terms of plug-in uh, that gives you a lot more facility in terms of uh, things that you can capture natively without doing any work um, it is also a, a natural part of um, Kubernetes which means that uh, it's becoming uh, you know a first-class citizen in the infrastructure um, and it's a very powerful uh, uh, utility that uh, has some flexibility around caching in ways that log stash is uh, not quite so freeing uh, but so people are looking at uh, uh, FluentD rather than Logstash but keeping the elastic search and its analytical capabilities and the visualization of Kibana and as a result we have EFK uh, and FluentD as well can behave like Logstash to the uh, rest of the stack as uh, one of its uh, plugins is a, a Logstash style behavior to elastic search so I'm going to do a little demo in a moment. This is uh, um, going to show you just a little bit, a hint of the art of the possible uh, and a little bit of fun. So what's our demo do? So I'm going to have a, a, a server running which is going to take two log files and it's going to do a little, a tiny little transform on one of the log files uh, and then pass that log file onto what's known as a folder. Um, which we'll see in a minute uh, and understand its role uh, and also we we'll just push its uh, uh, logs back out I could put filters into that pipeline just to say okay these are the events of interest and only write those to the log file uh, but for simplicity we've we've avoided all of that at this stage uh, and that could occur on one node or it could occur on many nodes and in fact uh, whilst the demo we will only run it on one node there is nothing stopping us actually uh, running this up on lots of servers uh, and simulating the source uh, through of course um, in a highly distributed environment we want to sort of centralize and aggregate that together um, and what we've done is therefore built a second node uh, with another fluent D configuration um, and this is like a, 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 an aggregation point which is going to take the folder uh, and do a common process and that common process is simply examining uh, the log 
uh, filter to, so that we can have a quick standard out peak of what's going on just let it stream through um, and then specific events specific log entries we're going to tease out and I'm going to send to slack um, so if, if I was actually configured to, uh, to look at or look for specific errors I could grab those and send it to slack I could even get very clever and say right okay that uh, uh, exception is in this part of the application therefore I'm going to send a slack message to uh, Joe the developer because that's his uh, responsibility he should know that there's a production error occurred right so uh, I'm not going to uh, use the screen gabs I'm actually going to uh, jump in to uh, some real life uh, development environment and what we've got here um, is two Fluent D configurations. You can see Node 1 and Node 2. And uh, let's just quickly walk through the uh, Node 1. So I can tell uh, the system uh, Fluent D how to log itself. And I'm just saying, okay, Fluent D, I just want you to report your info. Uh, and then um, in a fairly decorative manner, I define one or many sources uh, in this case I'm defining two sources uh, one called uh, basic file and then I'm getting a second source called basic file 2 uh, in the real world uh, you would potentially uh, if you were running in a, a legacy app server perhaps be uh, using uh, you know, a web logic or web sphere or uh, um, uh, a Red Hat Fuse container um, and uh, it will be generated in lots of different log files for different applications you will potentially separate out log files from your application or your uh, war or ear file perhaps uh, compared to the actual logs being generated by the core engine of that uh, J2E framework or uh, uh, micro profile uh, uh, container um, but however it's set up um, you can collect these and you could I could have easily have infrastructure uh, collections going on here as well collecting aspects like the, the, an SMP trap on my machine um, and then I declare those and then I've defined a, a very very simple pipeline which is going to do a simple transform um, and uh, manipulate the structure of the, the log event so that the log event uh, when it's passed to the central node will appear in the same structure irrespective of uh, the origin um, and then you can, I can show you the, how that differs I have uh, two configuration files here that I use in an, uh, an open source tool that uh, we've built um, uh, and available through github that allows us to uh, take data and create log events sim uh, or replay an application log file again and restamp it uh, and simulate it uh, or we'll play it back in, in in real time so the time intervals are controlled and things like that um, if you're trying to use it to test your, your monitoring configuration that you might want to re reiterate or loop through your logs uh, multiple times so we can do things like that lots of flexibility but the bottom line is is in here I've defined how I'm going to structure the payload uh, uh, and how I'm reading the source and then as you can see here I'm going source is the, the basic file and event and then take the event message and add uh, a counter to how many times I've uh, iterated through the uh, test log uh, data set that I've got. Um, if I go to my second stream you can see it's different the message and I've got stream and then uh, I've got iter same value but uh, I've just given it a different name uh, and you can see I've given it attributes as well that I can simulate class paths and things like that. Um, so that's going to go and get picked up by node 1 and uh, it will get processed 
and the important thing is, is it comes through uh, here now once I've uh, done the transform uh, and I'm going to send it to two places I'm going to send it to my uh, file that I mentioned and then I'm going to forward it on to the other node and that's declared with this declaration here okay oh sorry this uh, bit then says okay right I'm going to pass it on I want another pipeline uh, uh, that we call refer to as a label which is a series of activities um, and it will then match all the events that come in and every five seconds I will push log events over to the consolidated second node and then if we look at the second node which is here you can see my source coming in which is now my folder and I'm saying on port 2880 uh, capture accept events in um, and then I can look for uh, uh, log events that got reference to computer uh, so I can have computer with a capital C or a lowercase c of course I could be clever with my regex uh, uh, and say well it's going to be a capital C or a lowercase c uh, or you know ignore capitalization in the expression um, once I've filtered those out so not all of my simulated logs are going to talk about computer in any way um, but those that do will then come through the standard out I mentioned and then go on to slack um, and yes by the time uh, uh, we finish this presentation I'll uh, be changing my uh, token into slack uh, but you can then see I've configured it and it's, it describes the message which aspects of the log message could be used at the moment I'm just using all of it uh, but it'd be very easy to say I just want these attributes and pull specific attributes out of the message and traverse it uh, the, 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 the log event because I, I've applied some structure and meaning to it so let's fire things up so here we've got uh, a few uh, shell uh, uh, environments on my uh, machine and we're just going to fire up uh, the fluent D nodes so there's one and there's the other and we can see it processing the uh, configuration uh, it's just telling us about some buffer configurations uh, and then I'm going to fire up uh, the log generation process and you'll see it saying I'm uh, talking about the, the logs that it's building and what we'll see uh, is it's now processing these if I now uh, bring up my uh, slack uh, environment then what we'll see in a moment is as you can see it's starting to nudge me telling me that I've got events coming through and if I uh, bring this over you can see it's now to fluent there is getting messages and you can see it's built the, the message up uh, based on uh, telling me about which uh, node it is well I, I've hardwired that into the configuration if we look at the configuration and then it's uh, it displaying the messages and you can see it's changing the headers based on the uh, origin of the uh, the payload uh, and that's entirely my configuration uh, so if I whiz down it will keep churning away sending more messages to me um, as we go uh, and that's really a very simple uh, example of uh, Fluent D in action yes it's very Mickey Mouse but um, through uh, a few dozen lines of code uh, or configuration should I say if I come back here um, we'll see that uh, I'm consuming and routing the messages very easily and I'm filtering out messages over here and there we go so let me uh, stop slack because it's 
wiping it away. And actually what we'll do is we'll kill the processes. Okay. So, in the real world, you know, we've talked about the, the need for highly distributed uh, models. So let me uh, show you some options and, and ways you can deploy FluentD. Um, we can think about our, uh, how we're reactive and, and, and to support tr the, the tracing considerations potentially as well. Although uh, you might want to use something like uh, Jaeger if you're in a microservices world to do tracing. Um, We've talked about the, the challenges of being able to distribute to different tools for different people to teams to use for uh, for different purposes. Uh, but whilst I've talked a lot about uh, Kubernetes here, there is also a lot uh, this will do and is equally valid in a legacy environment. You don't have to be a microservice in a, a container. This can be on a real physical uh, machine because at the end of the day, you're just harvesting up log files or log events because you can actually wire uh, your applications directly to FluentD. Uh, if you're using uh, in Java, for example, Logback or Self4j, uh, then there are uh, uh, um, c uh, configurations that you can apply that mean that they talk directly to FluentD, cutting out the file which gives you an efficiency improvement and a performance gain because FluentD hasn't got to uh, parse the uh, lines out of the file to go, oh, okay, right, uh, I've got this record now, I'm going to apply some uh, meaning to it, but I'm not having to understand the structure of your, your log file. But let's look at some possibilities in terms of scaling the deployment. Uh, this obviously is a little bit like the, the, the scenario, mock-up mock scenario that I've shown you. Uh, we have three servers uh, showing you uh, one application uh, and they're aggregating into a central server uh, and they could have a, a secondary or DR node uh, ready and available uh, and you could then have some other servers uh, using uh, with FluentD instances aggregating to another central one uh, and the central servers are perhaps filtering out the most critical messages uh, and sending it to uh, a, an alerting tool. I've used Slack but that could just as easily be PagerDuty or Teams or, or many other tools in that space and then push on the logs for sort of more substantial long-term analysis uh, by putting them into a persistence layer such as uh, Elasticsearch or just dropping it in S3 buckets uh, to be pulled into a, a tool of choice um, and so on. But that could equally be uh, a Docker uh, setup uh, being managed by Kubernetes. Uh, well, on the left hand side here now I have a worker node where uh, it's just assuming that uh, all the uh, um, microservices are just spitting to standard out, which means that Kubernetes will pick them up on the uh, uh, worker uh, off the worker nodes uh, and uh, be able to process them. Um, obviously, that's less efficient because you've got to take a standard out feed and uh, then reapply the meaning. You know, slice the the, lo uh, the the line of text up to extract the time and date and the, the node that generated the, the event, and then the messages, which may can contain structured data as well. Um, you know, so if you can avoid that, then uh, you perhaps might want to use the the model on the uh, right hand side where. I've gone and put uh, Fluent D smaller rather than Fluent Bit, which uh, is able to do a subset of Fluent D, uh, but has a very, very small footprint, uh, and it can uh, route the log events through. Uh, so we don't have to reparse things to get that meaning. 
the fluent bit has done that or actually the interaction with fluent bit has meant that we've not lost it from the outset and we aggregate and we send to a central node um, and we can do things like failover and, and, and stuff like that or uh, as fluent uh, uh, D would talk about uh, do node discovery so we can go and find a node and we can put the concentrators into uh, pods if we like um, and so on uh, we could also address it by using uh, the sidecar pattern uh, so you have a, a, a docker and a uh, pre-built docker images with fluent d uh, and you can then just inject the configuration file for it to use uh, and off you go so again you know another option it's, it's just in the the options and the possibilities are really down to how you want to work and the, the pros and cons and the benefits uh, of different configuration approaches um, to wrap up i just wanted to share this this is um, uh, the basis of uh, a real world use case that we've built uh, as you can see across the bottom i've shown the life cycle uh, of um, the log events um, and uh, fluent d sits in the middle is its uh, real strength is the structure and root um, and we've got the information sources on the left varying from virtual machines to uh, kubernetes and docker images uh, log4j on an old java application and istio is involved um, and of course we could even harvest if we want to uh, deal with multi-cloud potentially the uh, log events being captured by a cloud provider uh, that could be you know, an AWS or Google or Oracle or Azure um, and so on uh, and then what Fluent did for, in this case was uh, uh, fed those events through to a number of different tools so we sent the security any security related activities to Splunk but didn't send everything to Splunk because it was deployed in a different location uh, and we didn't want to generate vast amounts of data transfer across uh, from cloud to cloud because you uh, start incurring costs there so we were pulling out the, the relevant uh, log events and pushing those out we were actually building uh, some very simple metrics uh, within FluentD uh, which were then being shared with Prometheus and routing on certain log events that were just showing uh, stats that were coming out of the JVM um, and of course a subset of that uh, was being sent to Elasticsearch for uh, visualization through Kibana uh, and we had some rules on Elasticsearch that if it found a certain number of errors uh, of a particular com uh, common characteristic then uh, we would raise a Jira ticket and of course we were nudging people through uh, email and slack on specific events of interest for them and um, in line with uh, you know the right tool for uh, the right job uh, despite having fluent D there for the tracing activities we still used the Jaeger uh, to collect the trace uh, data uh, and provide the tracing analysis and visualization yeah, because it's not a case of one tool fits, fits all uh, FluentD works well with semi-structured uh, data uh, and st structured data um, but uh, pure metrics uh, are, are quite often best handled by dedicated tools particularly for things like trace um, you could do it if you were really perverse but uh, it'd be a lot of work um, when actually there's a tool out there that does a better job and it's designed for that very purpose so thank you for your time uh, I hope you found uh, it useful uh, a lot of this information is available online as I mentioned at the start um, and uh, we'll take any questions thank you very much